England swung like a pendulum did, but the local acts sold to local kids. Here's some groovy tunes for you to get your kicks out in Route 1966. Big news, people. We're back in the 60s and we will encounter the actual Beatles in our upward peregrinations in the top 10 in the city that says, we don't want your rotten Olympic Games on the 1st of May, 1966. The Sound of Music advises us to start at the beginning because that's a very good place to start. So at number 10, staring hungrily back at the other nine as it spent its last week here in that elite company, is the Bobby Fuller 4 with I Fought the Law. The record, of course, is rightly considered to be a classic, even if it wasn't much of a hit. Three weeks in the top 10 for a peak of seven, it certainly augured well for the future of the group except that the group didn't have a future because in mid-July Fuller was found dead in his car parked in front of his Los Angeles apartment suffering horrific injuries. The official verdict was suicide but rumour has long had it that it was some kind of mob related thing. Well, that's this week's inevitable gruesome death out of the way early. At nine it's Herman's Hermits with Listen People, a little dollop of inoffensive fluff. Third only to the actual Beatles and the Rolling Stones as the UK's musical export of the 1960s, the Hermes, as the hipsters like to call them, have a pretty shabby critical legacy which may not be entirely fair. That said, the frequent lazy comparisons to the monkeys may be overstating their case somewhat. Seekers are at number 8. I thought of trying a count up this week, but when it all got done it just seemed a little anticlimactic. With what was, for them and their mighty chart presence, a relative fizzle with the Someday Someway, which only made number 4. Diverting from their usual gold mine of hits that was Tom Springfield, they went with a promising youngster just getting his start out for this song, one Simon Paul. This was to be the last week in the top 10 and it dropped off the charts three weeks later. Next up, it's the Jeff Spectacular Yardbirds with The Shapes of Things at number 7. The first hit for the venerable band, this features a remarkable solo from Beck, which he played entirely on one string, the G on his famous 1954 Esquire. This song would peak next week when it got to number 6. Jeff Beck, whom we so sadly lost recently, would radically remake this as a song that kicked off his 1968 album Truth and was a major stepping stone towards the music which shortly thereafter would be named Heavy Metal. The Rolling Stones with the fantastic 19th Nervous Breakdown fall a spot from last week to number 6. A double-sided single sharing the spotlight with the somewhat less prepossessing as tears go by. It's all great rambunctious fun driven, as were the Stones records at the time, by Brian Jones' swinging Bo Diddley-esque guitar and featuring some alarming bass runs at the end courtesy of Wyman. Charlie Watts' drums are even a bit more splashy than we're used to from him. The harmonies are very, let's say, loose, although they are more ragged than loose on the Here It Comes before the first chorus. It's also a fair bit longer than any contemporary record by, say, The Beatles or The Who. It got as high as number two, which duplicates its accomplishments in the UK and the US. Time now for the segment that has transfixed and enraptured millions. Hello and goodbye! Where we shine a spotlight on new hits into the ten and wave goodbye to those old soldiers who've stood their duty. And there is but one new entry this week, I Fought the Law, which peaked in at number 10. After debuting at 29 on April 3rd's chart, it has risen to 26, 20, 14 and 10. It'll be out at 7 next week. It'll top out at 7 next week and scurry off the charts by the 12th of June. Going the other way is 1966's local pop sensation Normie Rowe, with his insanely cheerful version of the Bacharach David song, The Breaking Point. Normie was never the greatest singer technically, but he just goes at this so hard and so uninhibitedly you just can't resist him. It fell this week from 8 after a 5 week stint in the top 10 where it has peaked at number 4. The next number 1 record is yet to come in the countdown and it takes top spot next week hanging in there for a whopping 4 weeks. To the trade up where we look at records on this week's charts that in an alternative universe may have easily vaulted into the top 10. Well, maybe not so much this week, there's not that much to complain about. It's a pretty solid top 10, all killer no filler. And we have a couple of bangers floating around down in the nether regions. Down at lowly number 39, having risen no higher than 37, is the small faces glorious and ferocious sha la 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 lee. Great as this side was, Steve Marriott hated it with a vengeance apparently. <laughs> anyway, 
also curiously omitted from top 10 consideration this week or ever, was number 29, Look Through Any Window by The Hollies, a nice little slice of jangly psych light which progressed no higher than 27. Come on, people, it's The Hollies. They make everything better. Five is Sydney Primordial's The Throb, with a record that was, if you'd run long enough bow, a prototype for the dominant 1970s Albert sound, with their stonesier than the Stones version of Fortune Teller. This record was to hit number one next week, so much for all the attention I built up in Hello and Goodbye, and stayed there for four weeks. It goes to show you how heavily the Brisbane chart results were discounted when it came to figuring national charts, that despite this spending a month on top here and some weeks at number one in Adelaide, lesser returns from Sydney and Melbourne figured this is only a national number four. A few years later, The Throb released a reworking of the old English folk tune, Black is the Colour of My True Love's Hair, as Black, which became a template after 10 years or so for what we call swampy bands, who later appropriated the English term goths. I love the goths, they were always such great fun. No, no, seriously. We're at four, which is a prerequisite for getting to three, and I know you all want to get to three, and I don't blame you because I've seen three, and it's great. Anyway, at four, we have Bob Kubin and the In Men with the Cheetah, which is an unexceptional rule for its time one hit wonder fodder. This is as high as it got in the chart run, and after a few weeks, Bob and the In Men faded into dim obscurity, became Bob and the Out Men. But that's not the big story here. What is really interesting is the album cover. It's great. The vituperative dolly birds have the cheetah cornered, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. His best girl is coiled cut like an hissing back, but the cheetah ain't no thing to him. He is possessed of some badass sang foie. Figure number three. It's Lou Christie from Pittsburgh, with his second appearance on this channel, this time charting with perhaps his most famous song, The Lightning Strikes. Christie was a pretty capable pop singer who landed a few good hits. Lou Christie was the name chosen by the record company without the then Luigi Sacho's knowledge. Luigi went with it because he liked that it had Christ in the surname. Lou is one of the few artists to walk away from Morris Levy's roulette records with either his reputation or his legs intact. Levy was to the American industry what Don Arden was to the English, only Levy was more heavily mobbed up. It was Levy who got his hooks into John Lennon in the 1970s and forced him to record that very so-so rock and roll album. Anyway, Lou's still going strong today with a solid catalogue of absolutely only in the 1960s kind of hits. Now for our number two, it's the actual Beatles themselves with Nowhere Man going as good as it got. This is its second week at number two. Next week it'll fall to three before bouncing up to two and then scuttling off the charts swiftly thereafter. I'm sure it's just one of those little jokes that the Beatles like to play, but on the Rubber Soul album, it's a bit obvious how similar the backing vocals on Nowhere Man are to the preceding track, You Won't See Me. It's just ah la 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 instead of ooh la la la. Half a tone lower for you keen in pedants. Usually considered one of the best Beatles records never released on an official single, as in a sanctioned UK release, along with the likes of All My Loving, Eight Days a Week, Hey Bulldog, or Drive My Car. Discuss amongst yourselves in the comments below which ones you think may fit that category. It faded off the charts quickly when it did fall, and the whole town took a big breath in and waited for the Beatles to drop their next single. Well, the facts have arrived, they've checked in and they've laid out their evening clothes. What time is it? It's Val's Fantastic World of Fat. Biggest riser this week, up from 27 to 19, is the so-called Walker Brothers, with Scott being magnificent as usual, and the sun ain't gonna shine anymore, representing for English specterism at its finest. It hit number seven in three weeks' time and was off the charts by the start of July, after 12 weeks. The faller was a newly solo Ray Brown with his take on the Tennessee Waltz, dropping nine spots to 32. Best debutante this week is a future number one hitchhiker by the Sydney siders Bobby and Laurie. It was the fifth biggest hit of 1966. There were six Australian acts in the end of year top 10 for 66. Only Normie Rowe and the Seekers had records bigger than this, although not with records that were in this week's top 10. It's an odd little record, a Roger Miller song dressed up with what approximates the psychedelic guitar, made by the increasingly ubiquitous Albert Records. And the longest running song on the charts this week is another Australian record, and another record from the Albert label. Women Make You Feel Alright by the Easy Beats, in at 20 for its 15th week, topping out at 5. Next week it was to be its last, but their next hit, the rather strange Come and See Her, was climbing fast. In the US, on the day that filmmaker Wes Anderson was born, Good Lovin' by the Rascals was surmounting the charts. Equally in the UK, on the day that Nobel Prize winning author Olga Tokarczuk was born, the crowning hitmaker was the one, 
the only, the inimitable and the unspeakably wonderful Dusty Springfield with You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. A year ago, the beatniks in their beetle boots were shaking their shaggy shampoo and sets to a top mop topular pop pop by the very same Beatles themselves, Ticket to Ride. A year from now, it'll be Frank and Nancy topping the charts with the absolutely appropriately named Something Stupid. And the number one album in town this week was not The Sound of Music. No, after spending 30 weeks at number one in 1965, it did spend 34 weeks at number one in 1966, and another 12 in 1967 before Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass finally swooth the beast. But this week, Rubber Soul by the bona fide Beatles themselves was holding the last week of a 10-week interregnum between stands by The Sounds of Music, going on to reclaim top spot for an 11th week on May 21st, and thence finally surrendering to the Invincible Bond traps. Hell, they beat the Nazis, and the Beatles must have been small beer to them. The Beatles did regain the number one spot in October when Revolver clung to the summit for three weeks. Argument may rage forevermore as to which was the superior album, Revolver or Rubber Soul, and I am frankly an unarmed man in the Battle of Wits required to solve it. I will suggest that if it's a question of consistency, variety and the magnitude of the sum compared to its parts, and the important question of which album not so much has the greater number of good songs with a fewer number of less than standard ones, then Revolver wins by a hair in as much as it's not brought down as much by Yellow Submarine as Rubber Soul is by Run For Your Life and possibly Michelle. But that's a crude and perfunctory view and the question is certainly worthy of more thoughts than these mere mental notes. Feel free to discuss in comments. Here's a little presentation I prepared before which will be the first in an occasional series of tributes to the Beatles, the most enduring of top 40 hitsters. So who's the best Beatle then? No, I'm sorry, it's Ringo. And in tribute to the true all-star in the band, here are his vocal performances on official Beatle records, rated worst to best. So the worst is Don't Pass Me By. A lot of songs on this list are poor recordings, rescued by a spunky vocal from our Richie. Don't Pass Me By is a vocal every bit as ramshackle and unthoughtful as the song that accompanies it. Matchbox. Ringo sounds as though he's surprised to have been asked to sing this song. Act Naturally. Buck Owens is a trail best followed noisily and Ringo's avuncular jauntiness doesn't adequately replace Owens' pathos as the emotional tenor of the song. And he don't. Here, on one of the most half-assed jokes in the band's catalogue, Ringo's insistent good humour manages to be the only valid aspect of the record. His banter with Harrison is priceless. Yellow Submarine. Loathe this song as I do. I have to acknowledge that Ringo's cheery vocals is not only the only good thing about the song, but also one of the most culturally enduring artefacts that the band has ever produced. Night. The song is a joke and Ringo gets it, leaning into the schmaltz with all of the warm-heartedness and sentimentality that only he could muster, and giving the White Album exactly the irony that it needs to close on. Octopus's Garden. Again, totally inconsequential fluff as a song and the tail end of the notorious Abbey Road vortex of suck on side one. But that doesn't bother young Richie as he carries on regardless, warbling obliviously against the foolishness descending around him. What Goes On, a song that is a little disregarded on Rubber Soul and would have been a highlight on Help, benefits from a focused and straight ahead vocal from Ringo who is in top form. With a little help from my friends, Great and memorable as this song is, Ringo's perfect vocal may have been better complemented by a slightly fuller arrangement. It's odd for a song said to be primarily composed by McCartney that it has such a Lennon-esque linear melody, but this is perfect for Ringo because he can rely on his sincere tone rather than his pitching to drive the song home. Boys, oh come on, this is great. And he drums the hell out of it too. The whole band is on top form. The older I get, the more I appreciate the younger Beatles over the later Beatles. I want to be your man. Conventional wisdom has it that the Rolling Stones did a better version of this, and while it's very good and all, that old Mick Jagger, he ain't no Ringo star. Now, after that Beatley diversion, it's time to unveil this week's number one. Now, James Brown may be the man with the funky drummer, but I'm the man with the monkey drummer. Get past the people, get past the hitmen! This week's number one, in its eighth and final week on top, is 1966's second biggest hit, Nancy Sinatra with These Boots Are Made For Walking, 
which entered the charts in the third week of February and bounded up from its debut at 20 to 7 to 2, knocking My Generation by The Who off the top spot, and then sitting there imperiously for two months, seeing off Barbara Ann by The Beach Boys, Listen People by Herman's Hermits, 19th Nervous Breakdown, Lightning Strikes, and Nowhere Man stopping them all from hitting number one. That's four songs in this top ten that got no higher than number two. This is the ninth song we've had so far to spend as many as eight weeks on top, and it was my birthday number one for 1966. Of course, it's an iconic single and a winning performance. It just seems a little rudimentary in the light of the huge strides that it was making across the rest of 1966. But that's not to take away from it. Nancy was the queen of the charts in May 66, and long indeed did she reign. And that, Shillam, is how the cow ate the cabbage on this most auspicious of weeks in 1966. Look at that biggest hits list of the year. Six Aussie acts in the top ten and one lonesome Americano. England swung like a pendulum did, indeed, but the Antipodeans ruled the charts. Well, it's been grand, and if the good lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, we'll be back with another instalment in another week.